Thank you. Um, what, uh, what we're talking about is what's new in radio surgery for spinal lesions. Um, I'm not sure that that much has changed in the last couple of years. I think what we've realized is that there are some increasing limitations, and we've heard a little, or, or just sort of shortcomings. And we've heard a little bit about the fracture rate uh, this morning with uh, radio surgery. Uh, but I would argue that some of the biggest limitations are our mindset. And I think they were very nicely enumerated right now with Rod. Rod looks at radio surgery as being separate from the world he woos in. Is that there's radio surgery and then there's real surgery. Right, right, Rod? This is real surgery and there's radio surgery. And you know, and I want to kind of get over that kind of person. This is, it's all in the world of kind of helping patients. In fact, one of the greatest limitations of radio surgery is that balkanization, is that it is, is, is in the realm of, of non-real surgeons. And, uh, and until we sort of embrace it fully, I don't think we're going to use it correctly and to its full capacity. You know, I don't know that I'm a, a, the world's best surgeon, but I'm a very competent surgeon. I think, the, and, but being a competent surgeon has is ma made me a better radio surgeon, and being a better radio surgeon makes me a better surgeon. So with that uh, little editorial comment, I'll move on. So um, I want you to know I'm no longer at Varian. So you can call me many things, but you can't call me a, a Varian prostitute. So, um, although I am a consultant there now still, so I have some relationship. Uh, I have, I'm filled with, actually there's another relation, I'm with a company called Zap Surgical now too. So, but what I most care about in many ways is, is curious, and I'm going to finish with my discussion there. And by the way, Stanford gives me free parking, so you shouldn't be, trust anything I say about Stanford. So, um, and, uh, and people always enumerate, you know, what are, what are your biggest conflicts of interest? And, and I sometimes think the medical schools are the biggest conflict of interest. I mean, they, they drape themselves in sanctimoniousness, you know, and oh, we medical schools, I mean, we're, we're, we, we, we speak to God, and, you know, and God, of course, speaks through us. But in the end, I've learned that in the medical device world, there's actually a greater concern about human health than there is in medical schools. And, and Jens is nodding, so, you know. <laughs> You know, it's all medical schools are just political places that sometimes, sometimes human health gets cared for. So, um, uh, this is the guy who started my entree into radio surgery, and I want to kind of just give him a shout out, um, spine radio surgery. And I think he is a, someone that I'd like Rod to pay attention to, because uh, Mike Murray um, um, had everything in the world at some level. He was. Um, he was heir to the Wilson Sports Fortune and literally inherited hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. But he also inherited something else from his parents. He inherited VHL. And uh, of course, his life was uh, changed by VHL. He was blind. He lost both of his kidneys. He was in renal dialysis. He had multiple brain and spine operations. And um, had had a, a, a total of 40 brain and spine operations and assigned things, sh dialysis shots and things like that. And then he was imaged and he had multiple spine hemangioblastomas as you see there. And he contacted me through circuitous route and said, came to me and said, I will never have another operation. I will never have another operation. I'll never have another operation. I said, okay, well, what do you want me to do about it? He says, make sure that your cyber knife can treat me. And I said, well, okay. Uh, I, at the time, I didn't have any money. <laughs> so you want to write a check? He said, I'll write a check. And so over the span of about a year, year and a half, we modified our technology. It was a direction we intended to go in, but we didn't have the money at the time. We modified the technology to treat his spine tumor. And in fact, a year and a half after he showed up, we treated him. He had a great radiosurgical response and did brilliantly for the next two, two and a half years. And then during that time, led, led his usual good life. He had several Ferraris, and he would take, a, I was a blind man driving a Ferrari. We had this beautiful girl, just stunning girlfriend, which I always admired him for. And she would sit in the passenger seat, and they'd go in a big empty parking lot, and he would drive his Ferrari around. And, uh, but he had everything in life, Every, you know, a lot, just a beautiful, beautiful life at so many levels. And then two and a half years after I treated him, his dialysis shunt clotted off, and he was offered surgery to fix the shunt. He said no. And the point is that he refused to have any surgery over a little fucking dialysis shunt. And why? Because with each little operation, a little bit more of his humanity had been whittled away. And we think it's a dialysis shunt. What the hell, a dialysis shunt? 
But the point is, it was too much. It was too much. And he died. He died of uremic failure because he wouldn't get his shunt fixed. And so I, what Mike Murray tells me is that, you know, we don't think much of an operation by surgeons, but our patients do. And this is why less invasive ways, like radio surgery, are a nice complement to what we do. Yes, yeah, sometimes you need to, you need to fillet someone open from you know C2 to you know T10. I mean that's part of what we do. But sometimes you know a minimalist approach is what your patient wants and needs, and I give you a way to do that. So now in the world of radio surgery, we have great little cool image tracking technologies where you know you can map the spine of live spine into a, a spine from a CT scan, know where you are, and instantaneously kind of position a beam to target with great precision. I mean, this is, you can now target in the spine every bit as accurately as you can in the brain. Highly accurate. And there's new technologies to do this. You know, my, my former employer for whom I'm now a consultant makes this magnificent piece of equipment. But the point is that there are many pieces of equipment now that very efficiently and rapidly and accurately allow you to deliver radiation with great precision. You know, you can rotate these, these x-ray sources around patients, get a CT scan right on the machine, fuse these, machines, fuse these scans, and then literally in, 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 in an hour, you can have replicated what might take a big operation to remove in the spine. It's cool stuff. And so, yeah, we have great tools for shaping the radiation, whether it be the old, uh, this is the, the cyber knife technique for pencil beam, you know, kind of aggregating dose over the tumor from many different directions. It's amazing what computers and imaging has changed the way we can kind of treat patients with. And the precision is to, to not to be denied. It is millimetric precision and without opening up the patient. And the ability to sculpt a dose of radiation with a sundry tools, whether they be a pencil beam that's optimized or whether they be a, a kind of a, this multi-leaf collimator, which kind of is, is kind of one of the industry standards. It lets you show the shape radiation to an exquisite way. We're literally painting pictures. This is what is possible with modern radiation delivery in which when it's well done, surgeons are an important part of that solution. So my very first patient I treated with radio surgery, spinal radio surgery, other than Mr. Murray, was this patient right here who came from the Northwest area. He was from Portland area. And he had this, this lung cancer metastasized to his spine and was literally in bed dying. And uh, all kinds of morphine, nothing made him better. And I, just as a, as a lark, we were thought we were still years away from doing this. But he was an investor in my company. He said, I want you to do this on me. And he owned a big... Um, Mutual fund. And uh, I said, okay, sure, Dick, if you want. And we, so we tried this, and within two weeks, this guy went from being bedridden on a morphine pump to playing golf in Hawaii. And ever since then, I've realized that this is a powerful tool that really should be practiced in, by every spinal oncologist. If you're going to be doing spinal oncology, you should have access to radio surgery today. And at Stanford, you know, we treated a little of everything, and so we're now well over 1,200 patients. A, year, a few years ago, this is what it looked like. Much of what we treat is malignant, but we treat a lot of benign disease. You can get amazing results. Here's a kind of a solitary spine met was cured. So it's a liposarcoma metastasized to C2, you know, got all kinds of fancy radiotherapy, nothing works. She was, again, kind of going down the tubes. You're not going to resect this sucker. It's, it involves all the vertebral arteries. It's just not a resectable lesion. But a little, oh, a couple day course of radio surgery, and there you are, she's cured. And she's now 10 years out. She runs a bread and bath up in the lost coast of California. So um, yeah, we need resection. I mean, Roy, I was sitting there this morning with Roy, and Roy has transformed the field of, of spinal oncology more than any figure that I know of in the last generation. Um, and he's shown that, yeah, when you resect these tumors, patients do much better than standard radiotherapy. But that's standard radiotherapy. And standard radiotherapy really doesn't do that much in a lot of our experiences, especially things like, like, like renal cell and thyroid cancer and melanoma. But radiosurgery is not that radiotherapy. It is an ablative tool that will kill any tumor, any tumor, as you'll see. Doesn't mean that killing it is the right solution, but it does mean you can kill the tumor. And so I think it is time, increasingly time, to think more and more about replacing many types of conventional, um, some, some surgical cases with radiosurgery, as you'll see. 
And so why, why is this different? I mean, this is my favorite slide for Rod because Rod loves this slide so much. But you have to understand that, that radiotherapy was in the dark ages for forever. Radiotherapy came out of a world of, of Marie Curie and, and ram testicle irradiation. What is this about? Well, ram, and I'm being serious, ram testicle irradiation. And so it turns out that in the early days of radiotherapy in France, um, they realized that you could sterilize sheep, and it's important to sterilize them in certain cases, uh, with radiation. And, but they also realized that if you gave a big blast of radiation to sterilize the sheep, you got these ulcerating testicular lesions, and basically your balls fell off. And it was not, I think it was kind of an ugly scenario. But if you did it slowly, if you were radiated slowly with fractions over many days, you sterilized the sheep, the skin didn't ulcerate, and the sheep lived long and prospered in the field without seminate, I guess, without kind of passing on their genetic heritage. So having said that, that is how, this is basically the most important experiment in classical radiotherapy up until modern times. And what we've realized now that with large, accurately targeted doses of radiation, you could do things that were unlike what was the foundations of radiotherapy ever suggested. It's about large, accurately deposited doses of radiation are ablative and get the job done efficiently and effectively. So how do we do it? Well, you know, you're, you're hearing a lot about radio surgery these days. It's not, I'm not going to, at this point, I can't tell you that, that there isn't anything to some extent which you know about, don't know something about. But the efficiency with which we can do this and the accuracy and the efficacy increasingly call upon us to question to what, where is the dividing line between taking a patient to surgery and trying radio surgery first? So, I mean, cases like this are literally done in 20 minutes. I mean, that's pretty sweet. You know, here's a, these big, long, involved constructs with epidural tumor. You know, it used to be, oh, if there's epidural tumor, you don't want to do radio surgery. No. Epidural tumor shrinks very quickly, especially with the breast and lung cancer, when done with modern radiosurgical doses and delivery to systems. I mean, even these complex lesions like this, we have a skip target. I mean, you don't want to take these cases to surgery. You don't want to, you know, it's, these are very involved. But almost all these patients will benefit from modern radio surgery systems today. And they're efficient and they're fast. And patients don't linger in the hospital. And, and you don't need to worry about wound break. Down. Like Rudy, Rudy was talking about how you get these big radiated cases. That doesn't happen in the world of radio surgery. The radiation, the skin is protected. And even, you know, god-awful diseases like chordoma, here's kind of a case I treated, was actually operated on here in Seattle many years ago, not here, but at the, the UW. Um, and this, this young kid had multiple kind of mets from chordoma, a kind of sad case, this 12-year-old kid, got all kinds of surgery and radiation and just kind of, I mean, just these god-awful cases, but a 12-year-old, a 12-year-old. What we could show is that radio surgery, even in the setting of a lot of surgery, even in the setting of, of of prior, former aggressive radiation can give you know, a, a pretty interesting level of palliation. This particular kid came from Canada and went on, you know, kind of live a meaningful life for another year after what was a, just a god-awful situation. But it requires, I think, a comprehensive knowledge of spinal oncology. What kind of what concerns me is that there shouldn't be this balkanization between spinal surgery which means big open surgery and radio surgery. There should be a natural blending between the two, and that's kind of my, my hopefully my message today. So I mean, there's you know a growing volume of medical information here. Are these blizzards of slides. These aren't to tell you that I don't want anyone to look at this, but the point is that there's lots and lots and lots of more studies that show the value of radio surgery, show its role, show the dosing. And you show its efficacy. And more and more understanding that your limitations, such as spinal fractures. Yes, spinal fractures post-radio surgery are a real issue. But generally, they're occurring six months, nine months, a year later. And they're occurring in a, in a patient that would be dead in prior years. And not all patients get it. And when they do get a spinal fracture, we have nice, I think, clever, minimally invasive tools to, uh, to ameliorate the problem, ameliorate the symptoms. So, Especially the work done by Mark Bilski at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering has, has really spelled out what it is to look for in the stability of the spine. Carlos was doing you know, a great job today. So who's stable, who's unstable? We're, 
you know, for whom do we need to do surgery up front? When can we do radio surgery? These paradigms are all being worked out. But I do feel that that spinal surgical community has not embraced radio surgery enough yet. And so there, yeah, there, as of two years ago, there were more than 300 publications. There's a lot in this field. So it's not like these are the early days. And so I, I would like to see you as a community of spinal oncologists, not just spend all your time in the operating room. I know you make a lot of money in the operating room, you know, and each little piece of hardware is, is you know, is a nice Porsche payment. But I'd like you to, I'd like you to trans, transition that skill and that energy and that enthusiasm and that understanding to the radio surgery suite as all well, as well. So you know, sometimes yeah, you just got to cut things out. You know, I'm not saying radio surgery is the answer for everything. You know, Cut the damn thing out, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out. I can't cut it out fast enough. But sometimes, you know, it's, there are other ways to do it in a less invasive way. Yeah, you don't always get cure, but you can. You can get cure as efficaciously in many, in some cases, with radio surgery as you can with, with selective cases, selected. With radio surgery, you're going to get with open surgery. Because this type of radiation is curative locally, locally. If it's a local disease, you'll get cured, as I showed you a case earlier. But you get great palliation, and then much of what we do is palliative in these patients. And both in terms of function, and, co and of course, you're not going to beat the cost and convenience. You know, patients like not to linger in the hospital. And so it's just, it's fast. We get this patients, you know, at most, you're going to take the biggest, of, most gnarly of radiosurgical cases is going to take you five days. Most of it is a single day, especially spine meds. Um, and you get rid of these symptoms fast, and the risk of myelopathy is negligible. This, the, you know, even this 0.5% harkens back to the earliest days of radio surgery, where we had the worst of targeting, the worst of dosimetry understanding. It's very rare to get a myelopathy these days after radio surgery. So again, why I urge you to explore this more and more as spinal oncologies, because I think, do think you can get localized tumor ablation as effectively as you can with surgical removal in many the smaller, more controlled cases. I want to talk a little bit about benign tumors. I mean, obviously, the biggest application of radio surgery is in the malignant domain. And I think much of what this conference is about is you know, managing malignant tumors in the spinal axis. But benign tumors, for anybody who is a spinal surgeon, is going to be part of your practice. Here, too, there's a role. The way Mike Murray showed you that there was a place for treatment of uh, von Ippel-Lindau disease and hemangioblastoma. The, the whole spectrum of phacomatosis that affect the spine can be managed with radiosurgery. And especially in the phacomatosis patients, you obviate a lot of surgery. So here's kind of a case in point. You know, this guy was actually a um, minister of health in, in Malaysia and uh, just didn't want to have a big operation. And early on, I didn't really know if this would work, but it sure as hell did. This man's 10 years out. After a outpatient, single outpatient procedure, 30 minutes. I mean, it's pretty amazing what you could do in an outpatient procedure. Yet another case. This was actually twice recurrent. Actually, after an open surgery. After open surgery. So this tumor just melted away. Again, a cure. These are like acoustic neuromas. Remember, we now, the primary treatment for acoustic neuroma is now radio surgery. It's now radio surgery. And schwannomas are schwannomas. So in the spine, they react much the same way. And it's just these are short outpatient procedures. Who can't like this stuff? Whether they be small schwannomas, small meningiomas, you're going to get the same efficacy in the spine that you have in the brain. And you know, these, this is an experimental. We've treated you know, literally tens of thousands of spinal meningiomas and, and, and schwannomas at this point in time. So. Um, yeah, there are limitations. You got a big spine meningioma, schwannoma like this. You really do want to cut this out for the most part. Not necessarily an 82 year old, but as a general rule, big schwannomas mean a big operation. You got to do it. But there are rare cases where I have, in fact, done big schwannomas for an elderly patients. There's a, a, a sizable literature now. I mean, there's about 40 to 50 papers on the topic of treating uh, benign spine lesions with radiosurgery. And it is an incredibly efficacious procedure it, when patients are well selected. Large tumors, no. Radiosurgery is not for large tumors, whether they be benign or malignant. But the ubiquitous small tumors we see in vacomatosis, it is a great treatment. 
and we can talk more about it if any of you have specific interest. So small spine tumors, radiosurgery, whether it be <clears throat> the CyberKnife or other, you know, called a gantry-based radiotherapy systems, are all efficacy, efficaciously treated with radiosurgery. So in conclusion, I'll tell you about when it comes to benign spine tumors, the majority, I think, are going to be schwannoma meningioma, some hemangioblastoma, that what we find is these patients are treated efficiently and literally in three to nine months, their symptoms will disappear. Occasionally, you get an acute worsening, but generally that harkens a better, a very good long-term course. So it's a little less true with neurofibromas. For some reason, NF1 doesn't react as, as sweetly as NF2. But this is a good option for almost all your patients who have these tumors. And it should be discussed with your patient. And I don't care how old the patient is. People, well, I, I do think if the patient is four or five years old, radiation is probably not a good solution. Uh, <clears throat> but for your patients who are past kind of 10, 11, 12 years old, and up to later in life, radio surgery is a sweet, sweet option because it is outpatient. There's really no downtime. And the complication profile is near negligible. So as a general rule, and this is where I've been burnt, you don't want to use radio surgery in cases of myelopathy. So this is a little true in malignant tumors, particularly if you have significant spinal cord compression, uh, and you can't ameliorate that compression quickly with some steroids. So generally, yeah, right away, you want think a, mecha a mechanical problem warrants a mechanical solution equals surgery. And the same is true of benign tumors as well, even more so. And so I've screwed up a couple times in my career because I've had patients come to me begging me, so please, 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 I don't want to have an open operation. So I you know, relented and, and I regretted that. And not that I hurt the patient, but I had to go back you know, six, nine months later and actually do a real operation, do an open operation. But there are cases where you get by and where, you know, it, and I'll show you a case. So here's, a, here's an example of where I, you know, the patient begged me. It was an older, elder patient. The, the son was a big technology enthusiast and believed that I had the right solution, even though this guy had some early spasticity. And I said, uh, well, and I, I relented. And I shouldn't have because a year later, nine months later, I came, came back and had to actually remove this tumor that you see here. So didn't hurt him, but I didn't really help him. Wasted a an afternoon in, the, in my radiosurgical suite. But I've also seen patients like this for whom, with a setting of NF2, multiple spinal schwannomas, you know, it's a young kid, but he doesn't want him, and parents just, you know, this is a poor kid, 12 years old, I already had five, six, seven, eight operations, you know, can't you avoid an operation? Yeah, we can. And you can, in fact, even in some cases, get by without, without an open operation. Do I, the trouble is, to date, we don't necessarily are smart enough to know which of the patients you might get by and which are not. I tend to err on going to surgery when at all possible, just because, I, as Roy would say, a mechanical problem warrants a mechanical solution, and that remains open surgery. So, um, but you get by, you get lucky sometimes, and you know that's what life is about. So, I mean, if, for when it comes to hemangioblastomas, we treat small tumors. Small hemangioblastomas, you can get an aggressive dose of radiation into. The large, you cannot. So hemangioblastomas are the least radio-responsive tumor that I know of in the radiosurgical domain. They're, they're like chordoma. You, it's so hard to get. So in order to be effective, that means you have to have a small tumor. Otherwise, you're going to deliver an injurious dose of radiation into the adjacent spinal cord. So if someone has a two centimeter or even a centimeter hemangioblastoma in the spinal cord, you're not going to get an effective dose in radiosurgery. You're going to have to do standard surgery. And standard surgery works, but it's, it's, it's an operation. And oftentimes in a patient who's going to have many operations in life. So <clears throat> we tend to follow this class of patients quite closely. And we have a, a kind of a sizable little uh, cottage industry at Stanford taking care of VHL. And we follow these patients over time with serial imaging. And when we find that a, a hemangioblastoma crosses what we call our threshold level of five millimeters, we treat it at that level. Because at that point, the risk to the spinal cord is negligible. And the, we can get enough dose in to really be efficacious. And <clears throat> to date, we have never had, in a series of more than 100 tumors, a tumor treated like this way ever go on to progression. 
So our, our philosophy with benign spine lesions, and this is kind of ad hoc, you know, it's very hard to run randomized trials in these rare diseases. You know, how do you compare a, a C2 hemangioblastoma and a you know, five millimeter hemangioblastoma in a 12 year old to a, you know, a two centimeter hemangioblastoma in a 75 year old? They're, but we're trying, we're collecting that kind of information, and perhaps in years we'll have more and more rigid data to sort of present. But we, we, we clearly need longer term studies, but you know, we're, we're not stupid anymore. We're less, we're still stupid, but we're not as stupid. Um, and, but what we've realized that treatment of benign spine tumors in the spine is really kind of similar to what goes on in the brain. Small lesions are efficaciously, are efficaciously ablated with minimal risk, just as they are in the brain. Can we, can we screw up? Yeah, yeah, I and mean, I've done plenty of stupid stuff over the years. But you know, it's amazing how few stupid things we've done. I mean, I, you know, in the, early on, I mean, no one had ever done any of this crap. And so I was kind of looking at this bleeding edge, and it was a little like, you know, Columbus. Everyone said, you know, you keep sailing west, young man, and you're going to go off the ends of the world. And, and the reality is we really didn't. But we, on a few occasions, we did go a little too far. And so here's a case of, you know, many, many years ago, it was a case Robert Spessler referred me with this uh, twice recurrent uh, meningioma and wanted to avoid standard radiotherapy. And it was a young gal. We treated her with uh, radio surgery at the time. And, and she developed um, a high signal and, and, a, and a spinal cord myelopathy uh, nine months, classic, just like classical radio, radio surgical injury in the brain, nine months after our radio surgical tours um, see a cervical, med a cervical thoracic tumor, she developed a spinal myelopathy. And, um, you know, it's, we hurt her. We hurt her. And that shows you that there are limitations to what we do. In hindsight, we never figured out why, but I think it was just at the time our technique wasn't as good as it is. It wasn't as accurate, wasn't as conformal. And we just ran over, so rare to see this today. Fortunately, this woman still talks to me. She friended me in Facebook just a few months ago, although I don't know if there's a problem there with a HIPAA. Well, I also have a, a, a little practice that I've really enjoyed, which is the treatment of spinal cord AVM, a, a kind of an incredibly rare disease. And I'm interested in it because it has taught me a lot about the, the, the frontiers. In the, they are arguably, this is the most complex form of radio surgery you can do today because identifying the target is, is extremely difficult because uh, you're dealing with projection angio. And the projection angio in the spine is never as good as it is in the brain. Um, and also because it's at the frontiers of our knowledge of spinal cord tolerance. We do know that with, with vascular lesions, you like to give big fractions. The bigger the dose, the more proliferative uh, vascular response you get. And that's, in fact, that's the end result by how you obliterate AVMs. So over the years, I've gotten involved in a number of these. And, and that's kind of why I think I'm the world expert. You know, so it's nice to be a world expert in something, even if it's an obscure disease. But what we've realized is that you can, in fact, push spinal cord dose tolerance past a level we never realized. I mean, historically, these, the doses that we give to what are now spinal cord even were thought to be totally intolerable by the score. But we have now evidence to show otherwise. It's, as I said, it's a sophisticated targeting tour de force. In order to target spinal cord AVM, we combine, you know, projection angio with um, with uh, 3D angio with uh, uh, 3D CT scan, uh, 3D C, uh, uh, CT angio, and so we have to aggregate all this data together in our treatment planning workstations. But the beauty is, we found over time as we gradually marched up in dose that we do a damn good job of obliterating these. Not necessarily completely as you'll see, but largely almost all the AVMs we treat, almost all, it's like 95%, are largely obliterated through the process that I'm just spelling out. Now, early on, we had no idea about the dosing. And the most common dose we've now used over the last 15 to 20 years, or treated the first one, 96, so we're, yeah, we're at 18 years now, is, um, is uh, this two times, two times 10 gray to 20 gray. And you can see there's a large obliteration here on MRI scan, which was confirmed on angio. So here's actually a case of complete obliteration under some cases. Um, what we found is that this can occur if, in a range of different, whether they be thoracic lesions, cervical lesions, 
Um, it's, it's a pretty impressive outcome, and this was one of my early patients where I had no idea what I was doing, but the dosing has worked out pretty good, but she still has residual AVM all these years later. But this woman is doing so well in life, she's from Michigan, she refuses to ever want to have anything more done. And I can't argue with her. She's had a great radiographic and clinical response, and here she is getting married a few years ago. Um, so there's, again, we've shown you from the cervical spine, here's the conus. It's pretty interesting how we've been able to transform a disease that was oftentimes untreatable. The, the, the classical history of a spinal cord AVM is presentation in late adolescence, early 20s. That's the classical presentation, late adolescence, early 20s. A, the type 2 glomus lesions inside the spinal cord are largely untreatable with endovascular techniques. And so you, because you're, you're, you, you, risk, you risk occluding the interspinal artery. And so the usual discussion is, yeah, you got a spinal cord AVM, and sometime you're going to become quadriplegic. I mean, it's, it's kind of a pretty bleak discussion. But with radiosurgery, we can totally transform this disease. It now becomes eminently treatable on an outpatient basis. And so, you know, in this series now, we've, we've, as we've treated close to 40 patients, but going back this last paper that we published in the Great Journal of Curious and where we were able to follow up 19 of these patients very closely, we found that almost all obliterated with the kind of dosing that we've, we've been using. But most importantly, not only did they not obliterate, there were no further hemorrhages. And this is kind of a slide I'm particularly proud of. And it shows you, it shows you um, the life course of this disease in a series of different patients, these 19 different patients. And you'll see that the life course goes back almost 30 years. Minus 30 is 30 years prior to radiosurgery. Minus 20, 20 years prior to radiosurgery. You can see how each those little black arrowheads represent a hemorrhage in the life of a patient. And so you can see these patients have had hemorrhage over years, over decades. And generally with each hemorrhage, neurologic deterioration if not devastating neurologic deterioration. <clears throat> but then at time zero, when we kind of did our thing, you'll see after that, not a single one has gone on to rehemorrhage. We now have in excess of 1,000 years of a cohort of patients to whom we've now followed. This procedure is working really well and I think has transformed the disease and shows you the power of a non-invasive, well, this non-invasive thing, it works. And it works powerfully. And it's why I urge all of you spinal oncologists to try to embrace it in your pra clinical practice. We're even doing some wacko things like facet rhizotomies with radiosurgery. There's a little, I've treated five patients in the past, had great outcomes, and we're now starting a clinical trial at Stanford. In lieu of radiofrequency, do it with radiosurgery. Peter Gersten at, at the UPMC is now looking at the management of other types of back pain with localized ablative radiosurgery. Because basically we know if you need to ablate pain fibers in the brain with trigeminal neuralgia or glossopharyngeal neuralgia or, or, or uh, cluster headaches, you can do it. We're replicating the same thing now in the spine. It's just another tool. It's another surgeon's tool for non-invasive ablation. And Peter's even pushing the frontier now trying to treat patients with post-surgery trying to obliterate, to ameliorate epidural fibrosis, which he feels is a big problem. And this is, he's done this in the past with standard radiotherapy. Now he's doing it with radiosurgery. And he's even pushing now a study specifically to look at sympathectomy. All of you as spinal surgeons probably deal with, at some point, have a, a little bit of practice with spinal sympathectomy. It certainly, it can be done endoscopically. It can be done with radiofrequency. We think radiosurgery has a potential to both preserve the parent function of the sympathetic nerves and ameliorate the, the, the hyperactive component of it. So I want you to think of radiosurgery as just another surgical tool. Think of it, this is, you know, I, I posed this question to Udi. Tell me, what is spinal surgery going to be like in 50 years? And all I, uh, I keep, I want you all, what is it going to be like? What is it going to be like? And, I somehow, some way it's going to be changed. And I don't, I, I'm not smart enough to tell her I would be selling you that right now. But I'm trying to sell you radios as a dimensional tool. And it, the fact is, it's a tool, is, it's just a tool. In the end, the tool is only good as the practitioners who work with it. And you, and spine surgeons are some of the most imaginative, creative, aggressive, assertive, 
bold alpha dogs in medicine today. So, you know, we, in your hands, I think radio surgery can do amazing things. So I'm going to end with my uh, with an editorial and an advertisement. So this is, I will argue, the very first case of spinal radio surgery ever done in human history. And it was a woman I saw back in 1991 who had a spinal uh, metastasis from melanoma, and she was at. Uh, it was a C3, so C3, or and and what do you do? Melanoma, not radiation therapy doesn't work. The, the radiation therapists will tell you it works, but it doesn't. So I um, I treat her with radio surgery, and uh, she had a very good response, um, as best as we could tell with a primitive MR and CT we had at the time, and it certainly ameliorated her pain. And we did it with this kind of you know kind of odd creation that you see there, but it worked. And I tried to get this case report published in three different journals. And it got rejected, 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 rejected. And, and I, I know damn well who, who my enemy was on the other side, but it didn't matter. It was all a political game, like so much of the publishing game is. And so that's why I've turned some of my energies at this stage in my life into fixing what I think is, a, is the corrupt, nepotistic, you know, elitist world of publishing. Because I think it is a major impediment to progress in human health. I, would, I firmly believe that the barriers to the peer-reviewed publication process are one of the biggest barriers to the advancement of medical knowledge and human, and human health today. Why? Because no one gives a damn in the publishing world about human knowledge. I have, I, this is going to be an epiphany for many of you, or maybe not. But the entire medical publishing industry doesn't care about human health. They care about one thing, academic advancement. Journals are all about academic advancement, about me producing something important so there'll be an important journal and so that someday you will call me professor. Professor. No one gives a shit about human health. No one cares. As a side effect, yes, sometimes we do report some interesting things and we do clinical medical sciences advance. But it has led to all kinds of abuses of the publication process. I mean, frankly, fraudulent science, dangerous science, just you know, horrible science being published because someone's trying to become professor. And the most telling was last year when in Nature, this Japanese scientists published an article about the conversion of adult stem cells to embryonal stem cells. And the world was just, the scientific world was just a Twitter. This was important work, important work. In fact, people kept saying, this is Nobel Prize winning work, Nobel Prize winning work. Yeah. About two or three months after the public, and by the way, Nature spends quote unquote, $100,000 per paper, making sure it's reviewed by the best people and curated and studied and tested. And then about two months after it was published, some, some grad student sticking in it, noticed that something seemed a little fishy. And uh, something seemed photoshopped. And then another grad student said, this is photoshopped here. And before you know it, there's a little course of it. Something doesn't seem right here. And before you know it, Two or three months later, the paper was retracted. And then about four or five months later, the, this is like last October, November, the principal investigator commits suicide. So this is sad. This is, this is what's going on in the scientific publication. And yet, I have the one, just let me tell my story. This is my story. Why can't I tell this story? There's a total, it's been totally corrupted. The good news is there's a fix in here. So I want to welcome you to my journal. Some of you may know about it, some of you may not. I want you to embrace it like it is the second coming. So Curious is this next-gen medical journal, which is tended to be free, fast, without any po politics. It's all about peer review without peer rejection. That's because after the fact, we invite those grad students in, pick up my paper. We invite the world to pick up my paper. My paper isn't great because it's published. My paper will be great over time because it's recognized as being great over time. So we eliminated all the barriers to publishing, getting your, your, your experience in the public domain. And then we let the world pick at it over time. That's because we have embraced kind of the crowdsourcing tools of the consumer internet. 
and it's free. How can I, you can't give a better price than free. And there's also no copyright barriers. So everyone can see your information. Why do you want to publish? Why, what is one of the primary reasons you want to publish? Well, look, look at you, because everyone wants to be like Roy someday. Everyone wants to be like Roy Patchell. So I was talking to Roy, yeah. I mean, how did Roy build this amazing career? Through publishing, through publishing. The trouble is it took him 20 years. Who can be smarter and more capable and more determined than him? And it took 20 years. Well, the beauty of Curious is you guys are skilled. You have, talent, you have stories to tell. What makes, what makes a great spine surgeon? Is it your hands not shaking? Is it like two or three little things you do? It's, it's 10,000 little, little tricks throughout that entire process of the operation. Those tricks need to be documented. They need to be disseminated. They need to be curated. Well, Curious understands not everything is Nobel Prize winning work, but it all has value in the collective human consci medical consciousness. We make it possible, give you that forum to reach the broadest possible audience, and the price is right. So I invite you all. Yeah, OK, you got an article for New England Journal of Medicine next week. Publish it, New England Journal of Medicine. Or Lancet, God bless you, God bless you. Go, go publish it there. But you know what? Most of the world we live in, 5,000 journals, and that includes all the orthopedic literature, includes all the neurosurgery literature, are low impact. And you know what? And you speak to your own community. When you, you neurosurgeon, you publish a paper. You, the spine surgeon in Seattle, talk to a spine surgeon in Miami. Okay, he's not going to send you a case. You'd like to reach the neurologist down the street. You'd like to reach the, the rehab physician down the, you know, in Tacoma. So the beauty of Curious is there are no copyright barriers, and we actually help you disseminate that information. Build your practice. Because in the end, we're a practical science. Surgery is a practical, practical science. And it's the, really the practical knowledge is what enables us, and Curious is what enables that practical science. So I want you to check it out, kick the tires, and, and publish early and publish often. So with that, I'm going to shut up. Thank you. <laughs>